Here at Johns Hopkins Medicine, known for groundbreaking research, teaching, and medical care. Welcome to Facebook Live from Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. And I'm Robin Yang. I am a dual trained plastic and craniofacial surgeon, as well as having a uh, training in uh, dentistry, as well as oral and maxillofacial surgery here at Johns Hopkins. That sounds like a tremendous amount of training. And now you're bringing all that expertise to work on a really big problem, and that's the problem of obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. Tell me just a little bit more about that. Sure, Elizabeth. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea is a condition that affects uh, close to about 10 to 15 percent of the population in the U.S. Uh, and it's a condition that uh, is caused by too much redundancy or lack of airway space in the, uh, in the airway that uh, patients often are found with symptoms such as snoring, um, decreased uh, sleep at night, obviously, as well as daytime somnolence or uh, the inability to concentrate during the day. And it's something that impacts um, so many people as well as affects most, if not every single system or organ of the body. Talk to me about detection. How do people find out that they have a problem? Oftentimes, people find out because of their uh, bed partners. Um, occasionally, or most of the time, you hear that uh, your significant other that you share a bed with continually uh, will jab you at night or will have to rearrange you to prevent you from snoring. Or even uh, oftentimes that I hear uh, your children will tell you that you snore a lot when you're sleeping. And again, is that something that just continues to get worse as someone develops this condition? Right. Well, the condition gets worse in a sense that it would affect other organ systems, such as your heart, uh, your vasculature, blood flow to your brain, as well as just generalized productivity during the day. Um, and so it is uh, incumbent upon you to uh, get that evaluated as soon as possible to get the proper diagnosis as well as testing. So when someone has had the diagnosis, of course, there are various treatment options, and there's a few that have been around for quite a while, things like CPAP machines that help people to breathe at night, but lots of resistance to that. But you've got expertise in something that's totally novel, at least to me. Right, and uh, like you mentioned, uh, you know, the first line of treatment is always the least invasive where we try to have, and it not only starts with CPAP, but it also starts with diet modification and other things that could potentially help you with your, your sleep habits. Um, however, if patients can't, can't undergo diet modification or lose some weight, um, CPAP machines uh, are very, very well um, established, and they do a, a great job of increasing the, the airflow um, through your nasal and oral pharynx um, as you're sleeping. However, we found in studies that um, almost up to 80% of people uh, don't enjoy having that, as well as the lack of compliance, meaning it only works if you have to wear it. Yeah, I've heard a tremendous amount of resistance to it, and I'm not sure, and I'm sure if we both think about it, I don't think if I had a mask on my <laughs> face at night, I would be terribly happy about that. And also, doesn't the machine make some noise? Right, it it is they're they're getting better, uh, and I don't I don't want to downplay the machines, but they are they are getting better, but they're not the most comfortable uh, machines to wear. Uh, I, I, yeah, for sure. So talk to me about this novel treatment approach that you have. So uh, I wouldn't say it, it's too novel in the sense that as a uh, fully trained oral and maxillofacial surgeon as well as a craniofacial surgeon. Uh, we do something called orthognathic surgery or maxillary mandibular advancement. And if I can kind of paint a picture for you, uh, the oral cavity and the nasal cavity is a three-dimensional box, and there are things that are put into that box. And there's only so much room in that box, meaning your teeth are in that box, a tongue, your soft palate, your hard palate, uh, your tonsils. Um, and once that box gets filled up, uh, if it's too narrow or if the, your tongue is too large or if your palate is too large, air can't flow through that box because it's filled. And so 
certain treatment management um, can come in the form of trying to increase the size of that box. And where I come into play is not only reducing the contents that are inside the box, but making that box bigger uh, by advancing your upper and lower jaw to allow air to flow in a lot easier and allowing all of the things that are inside that three-dimensional box that include your mouth uh, and your teeth to have more room to function. This sounds pretty invasive. Right, and so oftentimes when we're doing these surgeries, um, it's in coordination with an orthodontist. Uh, because we are moving the teeth, uh, the upper and lower teeth, in conjunction with the jaw forward, we want to make sure that um, if there are any issues called malocclusion or if the way that your teeth come together don't fit well, we try to get you to see an orthodontist to fix the teeth first, and then that allows me to move the jaws appropriately without uh, causing any uh, issues with your biting. Um, the surgery itself uh, takes about four to five hours, uh, and all of the incisions are inside the mouth. So from an invasive standpoint, we don't leave any scars on your face, but it is invasive in the sense that we're moving your upper and lower jaw. And will you talk to me a little bit about the results of this particular procedure? Right, and so when we look at the various surgical procedures uh, for sleep surgery, um, there are things that are called intrapharyngeal and extrapharyngeal. Um, classically, intrapharyngeal uh, surgeries have involved uh, making an incision and cutting out your soft palate and rearranging soft tissue redundancy in your throat to allow more air to pass through. Um, extra pharyngeal surgery, which is what we're talking about, includes surgery that's not inside the pharynx or it, advancing your upper and lower jaw to advance not only the teeth and the jaw bones, but also the tongue, which is uh, um, attached to the, your lower jaw, as well as the muscles that are uh, attached to your lower jaw to your trachea. So as we move all of that forward, it creates a larger diameter in your nasopharynx, oropharynx, and hypopharynx. And that extra pharyngeal surgery is something that I specialize in, um, but there are other options such as it, within extra pharyngeal surgery uh, that we also offer here at Hopkins as part of a team uh, that, that, that new literature is coming out, which is called hypoglossal nerve stimulation, which is also a very well um, researched uh, extra pharyngeal surgery. And again, what are the results that can be expected if someone chooses such a procedure? Right. And so when we look at the outcome studies of maxillar mandibular advancement versus uh, the intrapharyngeal surgeries, the, the, um, the curative rate, meaning an AHI or a um, apnea hypopnea index of less than five is upwards into the high 80s, uh, low 90s, meaning it can be more curative than the other um, than the other techniques. So to me, gosh, that sounds like maybe you just want to go for that and not even entertain any of these other options. Right, and if um, people are uh, willing to undergo a surgical procedure uh, that could potentially be curative, that's definitely something that, that we, we try to strive for. But it is not for everyone because it is surgery. Um, when we talk about kind of the pathway of what the surgery looks like, all the surgery is inside the mouth, but because we're changing the way you bite, we often have to limit your diet after surgery for about six weeks, meaning people are on a non-chewing soft diet for about six weeks after surgery. You said at when we first started talking that this condition, obstructive sleep apnea, affects all these different systems in the body, and I'm hoping that you'll also talk about some of the dangers that are there if people allow it to persist. Right, so if you continue to have um, uncontrolled obstructive sleep apnea that puts a real um, toll on, on your major organs, I'm talking about your heart and your brain, so patients who have obstructive sleep apnea um, more, more likely will have cardiac events and they'll also have uh, devastating strokes. So if we return to this intervention, how long can someone expect their recovery to take? So with maxillary mandibular advancement um, in an ideal setting, uh, 
uh, with uh, orthodontia in place, uh, we usually uh, quote about a six to nine month period that somebody is in either traditional braces or now we do things with clear aligners or Invisalign so it doesn't look like you have to have braces. Um, and about a six, six week recovery from um, your diet, but about one to two weeks before you're back to work. What, Evan, I asked you about this, you think is important for people to know? I think it is important to know that uh, obstructive sleep apnea is a serious health condition, uh, and there are many treatment options, um, including something called maxillary mandibular advancement, which I think is the only, which I know is the only surgical treatment that can alter not only your uh, improvement in your airway, but it can also improve things like facial form, meaning if you've ever found that the way your teeth come together uh, or your jaw is um, a little bit uh, too, too small for your face, this is something that can not only increase the way that you're breathing, but also improve things like facial form. So it's the ultimate uh, surgical procedure that can um, benefit your function as well as your form. And it sounds like you would recommend it for people who have obstructive sleep apnea. In the right patient who's willing to undergo surgery, it is a very, very good option, yes. Excellent, thank you so very much for joining me today. Thanks, Elizabeth.